from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. Here's what's ahead. K-State's Dan O'Brien will talk about how the weather has taken over for the moment as the primary influence in the grain markets, and he'll provide an update on the strength of local grain price basis around Kansas. Then K-State's Jeff Whitworth returns with his latest report on current insect concerns in our Kansas row crops. This time he centers on pests in corn and grain sorghum, including the outlook for sugarcane aphid infestations eventually turning up in sorghum stands here in the state. And later, with her weekly update on what's happening on the Kansas agricultural weather scene, K-State's Mary Knapp. All that and much more coming your way next on this Agriculture Today. Hamburgers, roast, ribs, steak, or whatever you prefer. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Kansas cattle farmers produce 7.5 million head of cattle per year. It takes about seven tablespoons of peanut butter to get the same amount of protein in one serving of lean beef. Support your local Kansas farmers and ranchers. Eat beef. This message was brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. This is Agriculture Today. And we appreciate you tuning in once again. Our grain market segment comes your way first with Dan O'Brien standing by now from his office in Colby, northwest Kansas. Grain market economist, K-State Research and Extension. And Dan, we're getting price-friendly vibes from the markets by and large, but for how long? And uh, it depends on the commodity, of course. But in the case of feed grains, the trade patiently waiting, maybe, for the August crop report to clarify what's happening with acreage. Yes, you know, when you look at the calendar, we're uh, at the point here in being just past mid-July, where in most of the normal crop years that we've seen since the drought, the 2012, we would by now have a pretty good idea what the acreage is. Uh, we would have had, uh, you know, again, some worries about the yields for crops, but in general, in most of those years, we, by this time, have started a downward slide into at least the August, uh, August early fall period, and really in a number of cases, down off into the harvest time frame in October, November. But that, that is not the case this year. Uh, again, we, with our accumulation of uh, first planting problems and now some heat that's hit, and again, if you put this together, you have a number of either late planted or replanted uh, areas of of the U.S. Corn Belt uh, that, again, what's been planted in just some pretty wet soils. We've had root development that we hope is adequate to withstand stress. Maybe, maybe not, uh, depending on what we're looking at. And here during the time when we're not that far from, we're either at or, or, or just about to start pollination for corn and other key time frames a little bit later for these other crops in terms of their pollination patterns. We're dealing with heat, hoping for the forecast after this heat to be correct, (laughs) that things would cool off and bring some moisture and cooler temperatures. So we're hoping for that. So here we're standing in, again, just past mid-July, and we haven't seen the prices fall off. And So that's indicative that we're in a different type of year than we've been since that drought year of 2012. Back in that year, uh, we were seeing temperatures jumping up to well over 100 degrees, 110, 115, and uh, and, uh, just cooking crops. We've seen some high temperatures, but not of the prolonged nature that we've seen there. Mm-hmm. Not so, yet, anyway. Not not yet. <laughs> we'll see. Maybe Mary Knapp will tell us about that later. Right. But we have that, as you mentioned, the hanging question about what acreage is. USDA making statements. Uh, again, I was at a meeting uh, a week ago with Robert Johansson, the chief economist for USDA, talking about how probably a general thought of about 10 million acres short on corn plantings would be about where they're at. And we saw the USDA come out in the recent WASDA report said soybean acres were down about 4 million. So we're looking at the planted numbers, still don't have a full handle on that yet. Estimates, again, 
uh, from 8 or 9 to as much as 13 or 14, with some ominous news out of the USDA. And ominous is too, too uh, dramatic of a word, but in essence, there was a statement uh, a few days ago that there was such a brisk pace of prevented planting claims that the USDA was softening their, their requirements in their local FSA offices to be able to verify prevented planting. So I guess the way I, I interpret that is that they're not telling us that, gosh, we got this handled, there's not that much. What they're saying is they've got so much happening that they're going to have to loosen the rules to get it done. And when do they need to get it done? Well, the market is really, really counting on, on this upcoming August crop report, this resurvey. And again, there'll be the resurvey of acreage that happens for corn, grain, sorghum, other major crops in early August. And uh, so here, here this, in the last week, we've had corn futures had come down about 30 cents or so, 20, 30 cents. And what does that mean? Uh, well, it probably means we're just, we don't have anything else to work with yet <laughs> in terms of information. So I, I, I think a lot's going to be determined coming into right after that, that August crop report. And, and frankly, that will reveal a lot, but we'll have more information, probably more on yields as we go from the August to the September to the October and, and finally the November crop report. So I, I guess when you actually look at what's happened in these markets, uh, corn in late June got down to about 413 or so, jumped up to about 470, closed yesterday at 424 and a half. And again, that was down a fair amount. Just a lot of volatility and back and forth, et cetera. And again, we We'll see what the hard data brings. Uh, it is interesting that regardless of the futures being up and down, when, when you look at the uh, six areas of the state, again, northwest, southwest, north central, south central, northeast, southeast, and start looking at corn basis, we've got a strong or almost as strong a, a level of corn basis across the state and in these areas as, as we've seen since 2015. In northwest Kansas in 2015, we had exceedingly strong corn basis. But from 2016 on, we're as high as we've been any time since and including 2016. And you can say the same thing, the almost identical thing for southwest Kansas, the central part of the state, uh, corn basis strongest it's been, uh, at least with the last numbers we have since 2000, since including 2015, pretty strong in uh, Atchison up in northeast Kansas. And back in that part of the of, of the state, 2018 was a pretty strong basis time frame. But the point is, strong corn basis across the state for grain sorghum, not quite as strong a basis. Not we haven't fallen out of bed. Uh, probably the strongest basis levels that we see across the state for grain sorghum are up in Atchison. Again, pretty strong up in that part of the world. Not too bad in uh, Columbus in the southeast part of the state. So. Interesting. I, I think it's a market that right now is pretty volatile, up and down. And uh, regardless of the features are doing, though, the, the basis levels are indicating that we have pretty strong local demand, at least for corn and in some areas, grain sorghum as well. Dan, one has to wonder, though, the markets are largely so convinced that the corn acreage will be reduced from the July report when that August report comes out, that the premium that is being gained by that uncertainty might already be in or will be soon, that maybe from here forward, not much to the upside is left. Well, I, I think until we get verifying information, that's probably the presumption of the market, really. And in fact, we're not really trading, I'd argue, Eric, consistent with what you've just said, we're not really trading the low acreage right now. We're trading risk to the yield on what we do have planted until we get that, that solid acreage number. So anyway, weather ups and downs, we did see uh, some weaker export numbers this week for feed grains. So that, that wasn't helpful. It gave, gave uh, elements in the feed grain market that were looking to go lower the excuse to do just that. So we'll see. I would say, too, that carries are only one or two cents per bushel per month in the corn market. That's indicative of a, of a market that's not really trying to reward storage right now. It's looking to pull things into usage. So we'll see where that goes. Let's talk wheat as we're 
very close to putting the wraps on this 2019 harvest here in Kansas. And in your notes this week, you cite the report out of U.S. Wheat Associates on the wheat harvest results broadly within our borders and beyond. And uh, one of the more standout factors that they cite there, lower proteins than desired. Lower proteins, not abysmal proteins, but lower proteins. Uh, the 2018 crop is rated as about 12.3% protein through July the 12th with the samples that they're quoting. They're about 11.3, about down about 1%. Test weights down about one pound per bushel uh, from 61.1 last year to 60.1. And uh, really not just terrible ratings for these things, but it is lower protein. And of course, what really stands out are the are the tremendous yields we've seen in, in parts of western Kansas, particularly northwest. You do see, um, again, varying harvest reports. I think through the central part of the state, we've got mixed results, uh, again, where they were too wet or, or other, other issues came into play, not as high yields as they'd wanted to see. But yet, uh, if you pay attention to the Kansas wheat harvest reports, some reports of, of some pretty good yields, too. So in all of that, what surprises me in wheat, with all that we're talking about with the quantities and such, in general, the futures prices haven't completely fallen out of bed. They've traded down to about 432, 433. They closed at 432 and three quarters yesterday and uh, have been kind of loath to go below 430 here of late. Had been down in May to about 390 and then jumped back up. You've got some international things at play. And you've got our harvest happening, too. So you're finding support from some different elements, different places. That I would say that the wheat, still, as a uh, as number of market observers have pointed out, hard red winter wheat commitments, shipments, and new crop sales are about 30% of the USDA's projection, about 390 million bushels for this marketing year. And we're only about six weeks or about 12% in. So that's really a pretty healthy pace. And you have just about the same, well, almost identical uh, situation when you look at the whole whole U.S. wheat complex. So pretty good commitments for forward shipments, and uh, we just have to weather the up and down weeks that we're, that we're having apparently on the way there. We'd turn growers once again to your notes at agmanager.info with a more comprehensive look at what's triggering the grain trades currently. And Dan, many thanks. Next Friday, we'll talk again. Thanks, Eric. Take care. Dan O'Brien with us, grain market economist for K-State Research and Extension. And agriculture today continues in a moment on this, the K-State Radio Network. While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State Research and Extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reach thousands of Kansans and more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu. Agriculture Today continues. At this point of the summer growing season, we make it a habit to have by our way every other week or so. Jeff Whitworth, crop entomologist, K-State Research and Extension, to keep us fully briefed on what's happening with insect activity in our major row crops in Kansas. And uh, flatly, a lot is going on, you tell us, Jeff, in corn now transitioning over to grain sorghum and a couple of pests still getting after it in soybeans. But you say the march is on for several pests moving into sorghum from corn. Yes, uh, you know, corn has been growing really well. A lot of the corn, once the silks start turning brown, they're not as attractive to our insect pests. So then they move to sorghum or soybeans or something else. Right now, a lot of the silks are just starting to turn brown. I've been looking, uh, sampling a lot of corn in the last two or three days. There's a lot of corn earworms in the corn. There's a lot of corn leaf aphids, and there are a few green bugs. So all of those are going to be moving and have already moved into sorghum. The corn earworms that I, I've seen this week range from really small ones to pretty large ones, which means there's going to be about a two-week period of time when they're out and about and flying around laying eggs, but it's going to be probably another week or two before that happens. So there's a lot of 
sorghum in the world stage right now. I've gotten several calls and pictures about leaf feeding on sorghum. Most of what I've seen so far are cattail caterpillars. Cattail caterpillars, in my opinion, are one of the more showy uh, larvae that we have in the state. They're black, white, orange, and they're hairy. They don't really get down in the world like the corn earworm or the fall army worm does, so we don't really call them ragworms, but they still feed on the leaves, and generally they'll get underneath the leaf. Most of the time, they're just around the edge of the field. But then also in the in the whorls, we're getting a lot of leaf feeding. That's primarily from the corn earworm or the fall army worm, and so far this year, most of what I've seen are fall army worms. There's a difference between a fall army worm and a, a corn earworm because the corn earworm is more aggressive or cannibalistic where the fall army worm isn't. So you might have one or two fall army worms in a world, but you probably only have one corn earworm down in there feeding. But either way, as they chew on the that tightly rolled uh, leaf, as it comes out, it looks pretty ragged, therefore the name ragworm. And I get a lot of calls. I've had a couple already this week about spraying for that. We don't recommend it. Mm-hmm. We've tested that for many, many different times over several years. There's no resultant yield reduction because of the leaf feeding or the whorl feeding this time of year. Those plants are really good and really resilient at overcoming that leaf feeding. It's just highly visible. It's very showy. You got all the fecal material. You got the big, you know, tears in the leaves out there. And, and the growers say, oh, I'm losing photosynthesis. You know, I'm losing leaf area. But it doesn't impact later on. We've, we've not been able to show that. Plus, if you do treat or if you do spray it, you can't get the spray down into the world to where they are. And by the time you've noticed it, by the time those leaves have grown out, most of those caterpillars are done feeding. Most of them, a lot of those whorls you open up, the worm's gone. They've pupated in, in the soil, so there's going to be a two- or three-week gap before they come out again. And then uh, they're probably going to be feeding in the heads of that sorghum plant. So if you have ragworms, if you have ragged feeding on the leaves, that's not going to impact yield. It's not going to really harm the plant at all. So just resist the urge to spray I know our recommendation says, you know, if you got 75% of the plants showing ragged and they're small worms, spray, but you still have a really difficult time getting the treatment down into the world to kill the worm. And again, like I said, by the time you've noticed it, most of the worms are through feeding. Now, is it true you would not want to spray either for the aphids that are getting after it now? That Exactly. The corn leaf aphids right now are in corn, but they're also moving into the sorghum. They also like to get down into the whorl. Sometimes... Uh, the corn leaf aphid, that's the one that they, they produce a lot of honeydew. And oftentimes they'll produce so much honeydew, the head can't extend up out of the world. But I've never seen that on a field-wide basis. I only see that on one plant here or one plant there. So I've never, ever seen a population of corn leaf aphids that would justify spraying for them. Besides that, they help provide food or a host or a springboard for other beneficials for later on in the year or for other aphids. Right now, in the sorghum I've checked, in the corn I've checked, there are green bugs and there are corn leaf aphids. Um, Those are normal. We've not had enough populations to worry about. And there are quite a few lady beetles. There are quite a few beneficials right now working on the corn leaf aphids. So resist the urge to spray sorghum in the world stage just about at all costs right now. I know it's difficult because you see all that feeding. You see all this sticky stuff on a few plants, and you think, oh, man, that's not going to do any good for yield, but it it doesn't hurt. Okay, so just resist the urge to spray in, in, in those cases. Well, you would like growers to be thinking in terms of being on the outlook for Sugarcane aphids, uh, a formidable pest, as we well know here in the state of Kansas. And the signals from the south are indicating they could roll in sometime soon. Yes, uh, the sugarcane aphid, as you know, has been into Kansas for about the last five years. It's an invasive species. It doesn't overwinter in Kansas. It comes in from the south every year it has, usually about this time or maybe a couple of weeks later. And I got the word a couple of days ago that the sugarcane aphid had made it up into Oklahoma. So I checked with uh, extension entomologists at Lubbock, 
Pat Porter, and he said that from a, a realistic standpoint, they're just about 40 miles north of Lubbock. So they're between Amarillo and Lubbock uh, right now. Yes, they will blow this way as we get southern breezes, but right now they're not into Oklahoma. At least I've not gotten any certified reports of them being in Oklahoma. You, you know, you get just people off the street say, I mean, I found a sure can if it, but you want to make sure it's been verified by somebody because they can cause a lot of damage. They can cause a lot of concern, and they have. They haven't the last two years, but two years previous to that, they did pretty good damage on a lot of sorghum. So it's a good idea to be watchful, and we will try and keep an eye out in the state. And as soon as we start detecting them, we'll try and alert everybody through our newsletter and through various media sources. But right now, they're not, as far as I know, they haven't been certified in Oklahoma. They're still between Amarillo and Lubbock. But they're headed this way. They were in Corpus, and, you know, they're coming up from the south. So just be aware that the sugarcane aphid is possible um, that next couple of weeks or three weeks we may start getting some colonies. But like I said, if with enough corn leaf aphids and other aphids around, there are a lot of lady beetles. The lady beetles and these other beneficials, in my opinion, really helped control sugarcane aphid populations the last couple of years. Let's hope they do it again this year. But Let's wait and see. We don't, we, they're not here in the state yet, apparently. And just as a quick footnote, there was an important regulatory clearance for treating sugarcane aphids recently. So that'll help producers combat that problem. Yes, there are two products on, on the market right now that are very beneficial friendly, I should say. They mainly target aphids. Uh, we've tested both of them. They're available on our entomology insecticide efficacy website. You can go get the information for Transform and Savanto. Uh, they work really well. If you're just targeting aphids, those are really two good products. Well, Jeff, briefly get us caught up, if you would, on insects in soybeans. Last time you were here, you alerted us to a couple of these uh, thistle caterpillars and garden webworms. They still out there and causing trouble? Yes, uh, I was putting out some insecticide efficacy trials yesterday. The uh, garden webworm adults, I was scaring them out of my plots, and they were laying eggs. I found all different stages of thistle caterpillars. So there's another generation of both of those uh, yet to come. Probably they should uh, hatch in five or six days. Then those larvae, they'll be really small. you got to really get out and look good and catch them when they're small, and they will start feeding all over again. Fortunately, most beans will have put on enough canopy by then that they can absorb more defoliation than they could a month ago or three weeks ago or whenever uh, when we started. And we, we've seen a lot of fields that were pretty well um, defoliated, at least parts of fields with garden webworms. Uh, so there's more to come, but hopefully the canopies will absorb more defoliation so we don't have to worry about it. One of the things that that does bring up, though, if you do decide to treat, if treatment is justified for your soybean field, Make sure you use enough carrier or water because these are contact insecticides. So you have to penetrate the canopy to get down to where the thistle caterpillar or the garden webworm is, remembering they're going to be underneath the leaf or they're going to pull the leaves in so it's a little more difficult. They're not right out there in the open like a green clover worm or some of these other insects are. So you got to make sure you use enough gallonage to penetrate the canopy to get good coverage. Well, row crop insect pests are plenty now hitting their stride in Kansas. So producers, be on top of what's going on out there. And we will invite you back soon to let us know the latest on that front. Jeff, thanks for coming over. My pleasure. Thank you, Eric. Crop entomologist Jeff Whitworth of K-State Research and Extension with us right here on this part of agriculture today. And we'll return in a few moments on the K-State Radio Network. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension.
You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, coming to you from the campus of Kansas State University. Eric Atkinson here. Now today's agricultural news headlines in brief for you, courtesy in part of DTN. Well, so far, the lion's share of employees at the USDA's Economic Research Service and the National Institute for Food and Agriculture are not making the move to Kansas City as part of that reorganization. As a result, some members of the Senate Agriculture Committee are raising concerns about replacing those employees in addition to filling already vacant positions in the agency. Their primary concern, the loss of veteran employees, would jeopardize the future of agricultural research. Following the USDA's announcement in June of the move to Kansas City, it was expected that more than 500 NIFA and ERS jobs would move from D.C. Multiple press reports this week, however, show a small percentage of those employees are in fact making the move to Kansas City. Employees at the agencies had until midnight last Monday to accept or decline relocation. The employees have until September the 30th to make the physical move to Kansas City. Now, the USDA Deputy Undersecretary for Research, Education, and Economics, Scott Hutchins, told the committee during a hearing yesterday the move will benefit agricultural research in the long term and is good for agriculture as a whole. Quoting him here, potential savings will allow more funding for research of critical needs like rural prosperity and agricultural competitiveness and for programs and employees to be retained in the long run, especially in the face of tightening budgets, in Hutchins' words. Senator Debbie Stabenow questioned why the Trump administration is giving NIFA and ERS workers a short period of time to make the move when needed facilities are not going to be available in Kansas City for some time. She suggested the administration could extend the deadline for researchers to decide whether they will leave their jobs or relocate. Stabenow said the administration was, in her opinion, undermining the need for expanded agriculture research and the usually bipartisan support for agricultural research, she said, may be in jeopardy. Now, a USDA cost-benefit analysis estimated the move would save $300 million during a 15-year lease term on employment costs and rent, or about $20 million per year. The USDA said state and local governments have offered a relocation package totaling more than $26 million. Hutchins said the USDA believes locating the ERS and NIFA to Kansas City will allow the agencies to take advantage of regional talent. Well, if you as a producer need help finding the right USDA farm loan for your credit circumstances, the USDA has a new online tool available to you. More on that from the USDA's Stephanie Ho. For farmers and ranchers, USDA has a new online tool to help them make sense of loan offerings. It's actually, uh, in my mind, a very valuable tool for farmers, ranchers that are looking at obtaining credit through Farm Service Agency, whether that's for purchasing equipment, whether that's purchasing land, and maybe folks looking for credit that are new to the agency. That was Farm Service Agency Administrator Richard Fordyce. They can go into the Farm Loan Discovery Tool, and folks can access that through farmers.gov slash fund, and that'll bring up the Farm Loan Discovery Tool. Simply hit the Start button, and producers can start to go through that, and it will ask five questions. Your answers determine which questions you are asked next, so you don't waste time. It should streamline the process, and it will create an environment where potential borrowers have more knowledge when they walk into the office or have a person-to-person visit. This is Stephanie Ho for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. Well, the Kansas wheat harvest is nearly all in the bin. Now you growers should immediately turn your attention to disease management for next year's wheat crop by way of controlling the volunteer wheat out there. This is a critical step in fending off a yearly wheat disease threat, as Marsha Boswell tells us this week on the Kansas Wheat Scoop. Marcia? There were several hail reports during the months of June and July in Kansas, impacting wheat that had not yet been harvested. Hailed out fields require different management considerations, depending on hail intensity. A hail event might affect the subsequent crop as well, especially in the case of wheat, where the hail results in many seeds that might later become volunteer wheat. 
Where wheat suffered hail damage after heading, volunteer wheat often emerges even before the existing field is harvested, as much as two to three weeks or earlier than it would normally emerge. If volunteer wheat is not controlled throughout the summer and is infested with wheat curl mites, the mites will survive until fall and could infest newly planted wheat at that time. Wheat curl mite infestations in wheat often lead to wheat streak mosaic infections. Where wheat was hailed out and volunteer has already emerged at the time of harvest, control should begin immediately after harvest if possible. This is true even for fields that got hailed out relatively early during grain filling, as wheat grain at soft dough or later stages of development already has the potential to germinate. If volunteer has emerged and is still alive shortly after harvest in hailed out wheat, wheat curl mites could easily build up rapidly and spread to other volunteer wheat that emerges later in the season. If this early emerging volunteer is controlled shortly after harvest, that will help greatly in breaking the green bridge. However, if more volunteer wheat emerges during the summer, follow-up control will still be needed. While hailed out fields may require one more field pass than normal to control volunteer wheat, it will help prevent even bigger problems down the road. It should be noted that grazing volunteer is not an effective option because there is green wheat material left and the mites can still be living in that material. On average, wheat streak mosaic virus causes $75 million in losses to Kansas wheat farmers each year. Wheat streak mosaic virus can cause yield loss of more than 80%. If we take preventative measures now, future yields will improve exponentially. Prevention is the only method, so stop the streak now. The best way to prevent the spread of wheat streak mosaic virus is to remove volunteer wheat and other grassy weeds. Volunteer wheat and other grassy weeds can be killed with herbicides or tillage. A second management practice to limit the spread of the virus is to avoid early planting. Plant wheat after the Hessian fly-free date for your area. In some areas in western Kansas where there is no Hessian fly-free date, farmers should choose to wait until late September or October to plant their weeds. Planting after these dates will reduce the risk for the new wheat crop and reduce wheat curl mites from moving to new locations of wheat. In addition, farmers can choose a wheat variety with resistance to the virus or the wheat curl mite. For Kansas Wheat, I'm Marsha Boswell. Many thanks, Marsha. Well, as far as the oppressive heat out there, there is an end in sight, as we'll hear from K-State's Mary Knapp. She's in next on Agriculture Today. Agricultural producers, landowners, and creditors, you have a partner in your legal and financial needs. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services offers reliable, trusted information and guidance. Whether you need advice for ag credit concerns or are transitioning your operation to the next owner, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services can assist you in making sound decisions for your business. To learn more, call 800-321-3276 or visit us online. This is Agriculture Today, and to round out our Friday edition, Kansas Agricultural Weather and the latest from the Weather Data Library here at K-State, climatologist Mary Knapp, K-State Research and Extension, aboard with us once more. Well, Mary, you've been telling us all along as we got into the summer that it would be, by and large, a cooler and wetter summer for Kansas. This week has been the exception. Well, it depends upon where you call the week. We look at the week ending on Tuesday because that's what goes into the U.S. Drought Monitor. Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, the week ending on July 16th was 1.2 degrees cooler than normal Hmm. for the period. The only divisions that were warmer than normal were the northwest and the west central, and they were warmer by a tenth to two tenths of a degree, so not exactly a scorcher. Then we went into Wednesday, and Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday have been warm, and they are expected to continue warm through Saturday into maybe Sunday, but Um, The upcoming week, uh, going through the end of July, we're looking at highs in the 80s 
which will be six to seven degrees cooler than normal. We're looking at lows in the lower 60s, which are also going to be below normal. So at this point, we may end up with the month actually falling below normal or in the middle of the range of what we typically see for July. Now, on the moisture side of things, we were dry. Not everybody missed out on it. In fact, there was a report up in north central Kansas of over three inches for the week. But those were fairly isolated. Some spots got it. You moved a little bit away from it. They didn't get it. They had rain out in southwestern Kansas, rain in south central Kansas. Um, So it was there, but there were enough breaks in there that a lot of producers were able to get their hay down and up. And that has been very welcome news. On a larger scale, talking about others in the region, there's a lot of concern of what kind of uh, hay supplies will be going into the winter year. Most areas uh, strip their Uh, reserves with the winter we had last year Hmm. and production and the ability to put up quality hay has been compromised particularly as you look to Nebraska, Iowa, Missouri and parts east where they've had a very wet time and not getting a couple of days strung together to to get that hay up before it has issues with uh, again with that quality. But the downside of this most recent weather has been the stress on livestock out there, Mary. Thankfully, there was wind accompanying the roasting heat, so that took a bit of the edge off the situation, but still something that producers have had to stay on top of. Right, and in order to aid producers with that, um, the Kansas Mesonet does have a tool that's the Animal Comfort Index. Uh, There will be an article coming out today in the Agronomy E-Update that details the point at which you can find that and some more information about it. That's at mesonet.ksu.edu under agriculture and then again the Animal Comfort Index. One of the issues has been that because of all the moisture, the dew points or the humidity levels have been elevated and that increases that stress level on livestock, even with the wind. Uh, Looking at the numbers yesterday afternoon, we had some that were reaching the 120 uh, degree range. And what was really interesting is some of those were in western Kansas, because typically you don't think of high humidity in those areas of the state. But you could pick out which stations were near irrigated fields, and as those plants are transpiring, they can pump a lot of moisture in the atmosphere, and that, again, will affect livestock. So you need to be really alert to those conditions because it it definitely will be a stress factor, at least through Sunday. Have a look at that tool at M-E-S-O-N-E-T dot K-S-U dot E-D-U, the Animal Comfort Index. Before we go back to the outlook, though, the The degree days must have been building up these past few days, Mary, and will that be of aid to those late planted crops that may not be well rooted? Well, it's a dual-edged sword with that. It depends upon what crop you're looking at. Uh, The higher daytime temperatures are not going to add that many GDUs to corn because basically the corn plant shuts down above 86, so that's going to slow some of the accumulation. Uh, the nighttime lows having that those elevated will offset that somewhat, but again, not as much as you might think. Sorghum and soybeans, cotton, um, those warm season crops will benefit from that accumulation and, and have more of growth on it. But as you noted, these rooting systems on many of these crops that were planted into wet soils are not as extensive as they might be otherwise, and that's going to compromise the ability to translocate that water into the plant. So we'll see rolling and curling of the plants in the afternoon. The biggest risk will be for producers whose crops are in the flowering stage where they are most vulnerable to that heat stress. Well, thankfully, as you say, 
this intense heat will be pushed out of here in a couple of days and returning to cooler than normal temperatures and moisture as well? Well, on the moisture side, the 8 to 14 day outlook calls for drier than normal moisture levels. The quantitative precip forecast for the week ending next Thursday was more productive than what we had for this week. We may see as much as an inch in parts of central and eastern Kansas. In the western areas, it looks like a half an inch or less. Maybe a little bit less than what we would typically expect, but doesn't look like a complete shutoff of moisture in that. And again, for many of these crops, having a timely amount of rain would be more beneficial than having that excess that we've been seeing all spring. Mary, thank you for coming over. Thanks, Eric. She's Mary Knapp, climatologist with K-State Research and Extension, and she's Mike side with us every week to talk Kansas agricultural weather. And we thank you as well for tuning in. Please be back with us on Monday, won't you? Until then, Eric Atkinson bidding you a good weekend for Agriculture Today over this, the K-State Radio Network.